Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Keel Business Gateway webinar. And um, today's topic is about how we might be, uh, might, how we might do business in a better way. So let me just introduce our guests with us this morning. We have Mike Asprey, who's the MD of Mondrum and Wayfinder Kick. Uh, we have Alex Phillips, who's social entrepreneur and support manager with. Uh, United Lim United Limited, and I have my colleague with me, Will Pritchard, who's one of our entrepreneurs in residence, and myself, who's entrepreneur in residence. Uh, so welcome this morning, or this lunchtime. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. You can uh, join us in the conversation today, either by submitting a question anonymously by, by email, uh, or by uh, submitting a question to the right hand of the screen and just letting us know what either some of your thoughts or some questions that you might have. The conversation will continue online at Twitter and LinkedIn uh, by using the hashtag, hashtag Keel Talks Business. So please do join in this morning. So I'd like to start by asking each of the panel members to fully introduce yourselves and to give a brief over overview of your background. And shall we start with Mike? Hi, yeah, I'm Mike Asprey. I'm uh, a director of uh, Mondrem and Wayfinder Kick. Uh, we're a community interest company, um, two community interest companies, uh, trying to reimagine what public services can be uh, in a number of areas, including in mental health and in the uh, property and planning system. Uh, I've got a bit of a mixed background. I've had some public sector leadership experience, uh, and I've been a director of a fire and rescue service. And uh, for the last 15 years or thereabouts, I've uh, been running companies uh, in the private sector, in consulting, but mostly supporting uh, public service clients. Oh, and Alex, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, yeah. Um, hello all. My name's Alex um, and I am a social entrepreneur support uh, manager for Unlimited, which is the foundation for social entrepreneurs. Um, we're a national organisation, but working locally in Stoke-on-Trent and North Staffordshire. And uh, we find, fund and support uh, social entrepreneurs. So individuals who've got ideas um, or are looking to scale their social venture or are looking for investment. Um, and I help to, I'm, I'm the first point to call really for um, people who are applying, people who are our award winners and um, give them a period of support of one year, which includes lots of things, including mentoring, mentoring opportunities and peer learning and leadership preparation and uh, peer networking. Okay, thank you. And Will? Sure. Um, my name is Will Pritchard. I am an entrepreneur in residence here at Kiel. Um, my background is, is primarily in creative industries and social innovation, um, particularly education. So at the moment, I run uh, an online community for uh, just over 800 social entrepreneurs. Um, as I said, I, I work with Kiel on the innovation leadership programs, um, and I also consult on ethical growth. Okay, thank you. And just uh, just to give a little bit of introduction to myself, I'm also with uh, Will, I'm one of the entrepreneurs and residents at Keele University Business School. And my background is in environment and operations. And uh, my own company, we grew that to, from four, the four of us originally to five and a half thousand people over 20 years. Uh, and in, 20, uh, in 2000, it was a lovely thing to do for the millennial, we gifted our, our company to our employees. And for the, the remaining time uh, till two, 2011, when we sold uh, to uh, an external company. And since then, I've been working uh, on my own supporting businesses, either to become employee-owned or employee-led businesses, um, but also uh, my, my specialism really is in transformation and people. Okay, so uh, let's start uh, with uh, a question really for for Sarah. Sarah, can you, can you tell us a little bit um, about um, what's your experience of alternative business structures and if you can take us through at a high level what two or three of the options might be 
Hi, yeah, it's it's actually Alex. Um, Sorry, I no, just apologise. No problem. Um, yeah, so I, I think from an unlimited point of view, we don't always prescribe um, around legal structures for our social entrepreneurs, uh, yeah. which is interesting because a lot of funders, particularly if they're looking for startup funding, um, would need to have a constituted legal structure um, and we're more interested really in the person and the idea um, and everything else can be built around that. Um, I think it would be useful, I can talk through really briefly um, a couple of the common legal structures that um, our award winners either choose or they come to us with. Um, the first one would be a sole trader and I think if somebody's um, got a little bit of an idea and they're just starting to generate some income. Um, a lot of people come to us that they've already registered the business as a sole trader because they haven't got any employees because they're not big enough and they're not generating enough income um, and they haven't got enough um, customers yet um, to, to have that. Um, the other would be a limited company and I think, it, you know, uh, it's not a dirty word. Um, because we look at um, how the um, applicant can develop their articles of association, so the kind of foundations of what they say they're going to do throughout their business. And um, it doesn't stop you from applying for startup grants or grants to enable you to grow. Um, and we would support somebody through those processes of kind of to decide what their articles might want to be, uh, what's important to them going forward based on their purpose. Um, and then the third one, I think probably the most common one um, that most people would have heard of is the community interest company. I think this is probably a bit more suitable for um, more established organisations because there are certain hoops that you have to jump through in terms of reporting um, and also um, asset locks. So what happens to your assets um, should your business not be trading anymore? Um, and uh, some people think that they need to come to us already with, with this kind of structure in place, but we would rather it be the other way around. So we'd rather somebody come to us with a really great idea, um, but not quite clear about how they're going to get there, rather than come to us with a website, um, uh, a legal structure and a logo and not really understand fully what it is that they're doing. Okay, that, that's, that's a great introduction there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, so I, I think what I think is interesting about this whole discussion is throughout COVID, uh, we've we've heard people talk about you know what what it what it's done is is challenged people about how they might want to continue to run their lives, but also can we do business in a different way? You know what does this mean for our businesses if we're talking about that? Uh, and you know what is this new normal and our new business or alternative business structures part of that? So not wanting to go back to old ways and what do those structures lend themselves to? Do they lend themselves to anything that might be different or a different way of working? I know from my experience, and we'll talk about this a bit, a bit later, that, that, you know, that what we did that, we, we changed our structure because we felt that it would allow us to uh, completely connect with our social purpose, but also uh, allow us to connect better with our customers and our clients. And we did it because not not uh, because we wanted to do well, well, we're nice people, but it was actually what our motivation really was to to generate higher performance and higher value for our organisation, which in in turn meant for our employees and for our customers. But we, it was about a different way of doing working. So, if I just move to you, Mike. Um, why did you choose to become a kick rather than keep to your traditional business structure? What were you trying to achieve? Well, we, we became a limited company initially um, by accident because I had never heard of a kick, being honest about it. Um, and so we set out in that direction. Uh, and only after a little while of trading, um, I thought I, our, our purpose is very much about having a public sector, public service rather, centred purpose, making a real difference. Um, most of the people in the company have personal stories that, that about brilliant public services and actually awful public services, sometimes in the same place with the same people. Um, so it's a very strongly purpose-led thing. And what we discovered a little bit was that there was a bit of incongruity between what we appeared to be before you met us and what people found us to be after they knew us. 
And as a limited company to our public sector clients, it looked a little bit like we were coming along to make money out of them, even uh, make money out of other people's misfortune. Um, that really wasn't what they found uh, when they dealt with us, and it certainly wasn't our purpose. So becoming a community interest company uh, puts a, a, a badge on the outside that says that's very similar to what's on the inside, that we have a uh, we're not here to make me or my colleagues a pension fund. We're here to do something that's about um, what we really believe in. Um, so that was the main the main reason for doing it. And that, that was beneficial to our customers. But it's also been a fantastic way of uh, attracting people who believe the same things that we believe to either join the business or support it in some ways. And I, I'd be interested in what Alex has to say about this. But some... Uh, funders or potential funders have said to us, it's very reassuring to us that you are in that position. We know that uh, you're doing it for the right reason uh, and, and uh, any funds might go to the right place. Uh, absolutely. I mean, just bring you in in a second, Alex, but absolutely that is my experience as well. When when we uh, eventually floated our company on the stock market in 2007 because we wanted to raise, uh, we wanted to raise funding to, to be first in market on photovoltaic, it was that it was not really on market there. And actually, our structure really enabled a different kind of, of investor to come forward and say, actually, we want to be part of this because we, we love the sense of purpose. We love the kind of organization you are. And you really add value to the investor conversations that we had. So I, I completely get that. Alex, what's your experience of this? Um, I think um, a kick is a kind of reassuring structure in, in many ways. Um, However, I think there is a little bit of misunderstanding um, about what a kick actually is. I think um, people do confuse it with charity sometimes, and that is often a disadvantage to the um, the kick owner because, um, while it, it makes it easier maybe to um, apply for grants, I think sometimes customers, especially business to business customers, expect lots of things for free. Um, and that just isn't sustainable for the individual social entrepreneurs. Um, I think they get, get it mixed up with um, charities and volunteering, and, and that's not what it is. It's profit for purpose. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's getting better, um, but I think there is a bit of misunderstanding there. Yeah, absolutely. It's not that surplus is a dirty word. It's what you use that surplus for and the purpose for what that surplus is meant for, isn't it? And that's the confusion that's often often in the middle of, of that. Uh, Will, do you have a question here? I, I do. I'd like to follow up on that, if if I may. Um, you mentioned you mentioned purpose there. You mentioned surplus. Um, can you give us a, an idea? Maybe start with Mike around what you know. Obviously, you're generating profit. Where is that profit going? Are you, have you got projects? Um, what, what are you doing with it? Yeah, I, I'd just like to emphasise that a, a kick is a really, and should be a really commercial, um, uh, fee earning centred uh, a business. Because if you believe, as we do, that you're going to do great things, it's really important to make the money that enables you to do that. Uh, I don't see any contradiction at all. Um, we have a couple of things going on. We decided to set up a, a specific community interest project, which we call Nurture. Uh, and it's about creating um, environments, be they small or large, natural environments, places outside, planting trees, planting things, creating uh, good places to be. Um, the, the word Mondrome actually has an ancient meaning. It means a place of happiness. So it, it fits rather nicely with this. And uh, Mondrome was a forest, so planting goes well. There's an environmental component to it. But it's about well-being and mental health. The other business, Wayfinder, is focuses on um, supporting uh, people through their mental illness journeys, um, and it's about engaging with communities. So the the, the projects we've just begun beginning to we're very new as a kick, but just beginning to are very much centred on starting with who is the customer and what do they need, which community are we supporting, rather than creating something. Uh, and then looking for somebody to uh, uh, to benefit from it, much as you would with any uh, uh, new start, uh, starting with what your customers need. And then the other thing is, uh, uh, slightly contrary to what Alex was saying, but not really, is we've been giving some stuff away for free. Um, we, we have been using uh, some of our time capital and uh, funding to develop products in COVID 
um, in the Wayfinder uh, kick to support community mental health networks to, prov uh, to provide and restart their uh, peer support networks that have had to be stopped because of um, the restrictions in lockdown about face-to-face -face meetings. So you can imagine people with uh, the parents of or people with mental health challenges who particularly need that contact at the moment, finding it more difficult because of lockdown. Uh, we, we've uh, we've begun providing uh, our Wayfinder Connect platform so that they can do that. Uh, and that's brilliant commercially for us as well because we're learning lots about uh, what people want out of those products and how to develop, develop them. And we're getting good, uh, we hope, uh, some good feedback as we do it. Uh, and it just fits really well with uh, what we're trying to achieve as an organization. Yeah, absolutely. That that integrity gap, as I, I often talk about, is the difference between what you say and what you do. And organizations like yourself, the kick enables you to, I'm not saying other companies can't, and I work with many traditional organizations that absolutely do that. But with the kick, it just starts that conversation. It's an easier conversation to have, isn't it? Um, Alex, it, What's your experience of this, particularly of companies and communities who are working in the in the, the North Staffs? Do you have ex, 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 you know, sort of experience of, of this as well? So can you um, just add a bit to that question, sorry, about... Sorry, I'm just saying, in terms of, of building a social purpose and the connection between what you do as a business and how you feed back into communities and, 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 and strengthening communities and making communities more resilient, do you have experience or, or um, stories of, of the people you work with? Yeah, absolutely, because I think it's, um, it's the purpose um, that brings the groups of social entrepreneurs that I'm working with together um, because they're all pulling in the same direction so they might have different objectives so some have got an environmental focus some have got a mental well-being focus um, some have got um, a focus on kind of valuing um, vol the voluntary sector and uh, and the work that that involves but um, yeah the the values I think is stuff that, that it really does bind people together um, and it enables them to work collaboratively um, to help um, understand what the landscape is and what the barriers might be to them to, um, to be sustainable in the future. Um, and to look at strategies about how they might connect with corporate businesses um, and looking at the, the timing of, of now and you know all the things that are going on in the world, the environmental, um, you know, the stuff that's going on in America at the moment, which is going across the world, the, the uh, COVID. Um, and it's those values that are underpinning that are really motivating people to want to work together and to be able to come through this in a creative way um, by um, not only working collaboratively, but looking at kind of the landscape and how we might be able to influence the system to change attitudes um, it's quite an exciting time it's a big challenge um, but yeah I, I definitely think that the kind of value propositions of all our social entrepreneurs are really helping to bind people together under a common purpose okay so um so if you if we look at this structure that um and you're working with the clients. I think it's really, you know, we've got to look, we're still doing business and we're still there to make money and we're still there to employ people. You know, this is, we do have that social purpose. We have a reason to get up in the morning, but we still have to do, like you've mentioned already, Mike, that you still absolutely have to have a load of commercial thinking in there. That doesn't change and that's absolutely real. So how does the structure or does the structure, I guess the question is, does the structure give you greater freedom? Have you found, Mike, a greater freedom of working with clients and customers? Do, you know, you've talked about you're giving stuff away and, you you know, that's been able to, enabled you to be able to do that. It's made it a little easier to do that. But does it feel different for your customers? Um, <clears throat> it certainly feels different um, for us in dealing with our customers, uh, we have found them more open to this collaborative way of working. I think we appear to be initially less threatening. There's a, there's a, there's a barrier that used to be there that isn't there anymore. Um, it's not the same for everybody. Alex was saying, actually, a kick looks like a charity to a, a, 
uh, a, a private sector organization. A kick looks like a friend to much of the public sector. A kick looks like a commercial uh, wolf in sheep's clothing to the charity sector sometimes. So, uh, and you're exactly the same thing. So it's, it's not a, a panacea. Um, but the, um, it, it certainly um, helps you to think in a way which I think all businesses should. Um, good leadership is about being confident enough to collaborate with people without fear. If we do things together in competition, then I think that's anti-success in many ways. Being able to build this vital commodity called trust and being able to reach out in a way to look at things from somebody else's perspective and bring yourself into their world from their perspective, looking to help them solve the things that they want to solve, um, is a really powerful way of getting business and making things happen which would not happen if you did not do that. So whilst I think that's something that happens in, in, in kicks and, and not-for-profits, um, there's a strong argument to say that that's just good practice. It's good collaborative leadership. And there are lots of examples in this COVID time and in lockdown where we have been forced, not because we wanted to, but we've been forced to collaborate in that way. And we've seen the benefit from it. And what I hope is post COVID that people will go back and remember why they did that uh, and then go beyond why they did it to remembering how good it was um, uh, uh, so that yeah. it's sustained as we go forward. So that kind of leads us on to uh, another challenge, I think, for all businesses, and that is, do, do alternative structures, do they demand a different way of leading? And I'll, I'll explain what I, I mean by this. I think you've just alluded to it there. there. And, and I don't think it's about you're in one structure, you lead in one way, and you're in another structure. leading. It's about great leadership. It's not, you know, regardless of your structure. So... Leadership, in, in, in my experience, in an employee-owned business was different in the sense that senior leaders, um, you know, I, I, my, well, my business was one of the, the largest um, employee-owned businesses because they tend to be quite small. The next one, the next biggest one to us was John Lewis Partnership. Can you believe that? It was 90,000 people. So, you know, there's big gaps in terms of sizes of, of these companies. So... Um, the leadership is different because, um, you know, companies that I've been associated with, like Gripple, Make Architects, uh, John Lewis Punch, there's a whole range of very, very different kinds of businesses. Well, the thing that, that uh, binds us together is actually when you're a leader in these businesses, not only are you uh, leading and managing the organisation and your employees as employees, you're also ma uh, leading those people as stakeholders in the business as well. And that, that demands a very different level of everything in terms of communication, accountability, responsibility. It is a different way of leading. And I think that for, for me, that as a, as a senior leader in those, that organization, it just meant that I, I was on my metal every single day of, 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 of my working life. Uh, and even through my um, my involvement in the Oxford Centre for Mutuals, which is one of the great organisations which supports the employee-led businesses, they you know they've identified and and working with them. We when I worked at Baxter, we were we were talking really about not only our employees in uh, employee-led businesses like a kick that they have greater accountability for the results by managers, but managers are regularly held to account by their employee owners, if you like, or that their employees themselves for the policies and strategies for the future of the organisations. You attract through your structure some really great, you know, different kind of people, in my experience. And that's big news. That's big news. And to of, uh, the challenge of COVID, it's big news. So do you think, do, is your experience very similar? Do you think we also need, or does it demand a different way of leading? Was, was that uh, was that to me? Yes, yeah, sorry, Mike. It was, or even yeah. to Alex. Well, yes, to you first. Um, yeah, I, I think we're 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 not yet a, a, an employee-owned business, but that will be the plan as we we get a little uh, further aligned. But I think there are two different kinds of ownership. There's ownership uh, in a sense of uh, legal ownership, and then there's ownership in sense of uh, uh, owning a shared purpose and mission. And it's absolutely the case that uh, um, it's important to us that uh, all of us in the business have this 
ownership. Um, so being able to talk about purpose and things that chime with people's lives and their passions uh, is fantastic. Um, and it's really important to people. People have joined our business, um, not on the basis of what we pay them, but, but what we give them uh, in enabling them to do something that they feel is worthwhile and to work in an environment in which they feel valued. We're very lucky to have attracted yeah. some very talented young people and other people um, uh, to do that. Um, and I think of myself very much of the current custodian of this business. It, it is theirs in the future. Um, uh, I'm not 21. Um, you may have spotted. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think in that sense, yes. But I, I do believe that um, good leadership is good leadership. I hear a lot spoken about, oh, this is being done badly, it should be moved into the private sector, or this is being done badly, it should be moved into the public sector. And sometimes that's dogma, and it isn't really borne out either by logic or data or facts. Um, I find really excellent leadership in, in, in all sectors. And I feel really, I see some really diabolical leadership in all sectors. And that, I think, is the, the main thing that makes the difference. Okay, that, that, thank you. Thank you, Mike. So, um, Alex, do you, in, from your experience with the organisations you work with, do you find those organisations tend to be less hierarchical? Um, you know, what, what is the quality of the interaction between employees and the organisation itself? Okay, so the, the majority of the people that I work with are quite early stage. Um, so they may only be working with small numbers of people, perhaps not even as employees. So um, quite a few of my award winners work with volunteers, and that might be volunteer board members. Um, and I think um, on the whole, they do really well at attracting people who share the same values as the business. So if they can't yet afford to employ somebody, getting a really great board on board is is just as important to fill in some of those skills gaps that they might have. Um, a lot of the people that we work with um, are leaders with lived experience, so people who've been motivated to set up businesses because of something that's happened to them personally or something that's really um, affected them. So there might be somebody with a really great idea, but without those kind of leadership skills. So I think part of the experience, um, particularly in North Staffordshire, where we're working with a cohort of people, is around developing those um, skills um, around leadership, collaboration. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's difficult to say because of the lack of employees, really, but um, there's... There's a lot of issues, a lot of barriers, um, and by working together with other organisations at a similar stage, I think that's um, that's a, a really beneficial um, route to go down. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you for that. Do if we can just um, just move back to, to th thinking about our customers again, because I've got a question here from Beverly uh, from Synergy Synthetic Surfaces, and I'll just read out her question. She says. I have designed a safer sports surface uh, with the potential of multi-sports application. We have exceeded uh, specifications and advanced scientific testing techniques, so quite way down the road there. Uh, but it is B2B, and there has been some resistance to discussing reducing the risk of injury in sport. How, how can we help our clients to be more comfortable discussing these issues? Uh, let's go to, to Mike first. Um, that sounds like a tough question. Um, it is a tough question, isn't it? I guess we can only answer it from the perspective as how, how can we use uh, the structure to have conversations with customers that might be difficult to have? I, th I think um, almost irrespective of the center, uh, sector and whether or not you have something that you believe is great for um, the people you, you think can benefit from it, um, this, in, in the end, comes down to good selling uh, and good human connections. Um, we've been giving some things away. We've had to try just as hard to give them away as ever we have had to try to uh, sell things that people are paying for. Uh, it, it seems to us there's next to no difference. Um, and having a brilliant product that can really help in a, in a social context does not mean that anybody is going to take it from you. 
um, and all those things which are true for any kind of business in, in understanding customer and being very targeted and focused and seeing things from their perspective and understanding the reason that would make them want your fabulous thing, they apply here as well. And so uh, forgive me if that's a too generic an answer, but I think it's, you know, that's what I believe. Uh, it, it's, it's good human connections with people that are the start of good selling. Yeah, absolutely. What about your experience, Alex? Um, I, I'd say um, if I was advising my social entrepreneur, I'd, I'd ask them to look at um, like what else is out there as an alternative to this and what is the unique selling point of, of what it is that you're offering. But look at those organisations that you're looking to sell into um, and kind of pick up on the um, what's in it for them. Um, because like, like Mike says, you might have this brilliant product, but unless you can match um, your product and what it has to offer with the perceived needs of that organisation that you're trying to sell to, then um, I think it's really difficult to get in to have that human conversation. I think once that rapport has been developed, um, then you could then um, talk more in the specifics of what you have in mind. But I think you have to uh, play the game, I guess, a little bit in terms of finding out what, what they want to get out of your product um, potentially and then and then use that as a hook mm -hmm. for further conversations. So I, I guess that's not a, a structure thing. That's actually a good business thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the material. So I've got, let me just, um, I've got a couple of questions here that are coming through on email. I've got a question here from Jeremy Cliff um, from from Human Nature Escapes and he's a kick and he's he's saying fundamentally he's really struggled to engage uh, with with different organisations including universities over over the over the last few years. What's what's your experience in terms of collaboration because I know Mike you talk a lot about collaboration and the and the success you've had. Have you got any advice there? Um. Well, each of us is different, I'm sure. And so um, what's true for, for our kicks uh, may not be true for, for others. So, um, um, uh, and I, I know next to nothing about uh, 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 Jeremy's uh, uh, yeah. organization. Um, but I think um, making the first move is what uh, seems to be successful for us. Often people think, uh, if you're in any position, if you're in two different positions, sometimes people will say, no, this is my position, I'm going to stay here. Or they'll even say, I, I quite like to move, I'm prepared to move to the middle ground. But even the middle ground leaves a gap. And so if you want to really uh, uh, reach out and collaborate with somebody, I think you have to go and stand where they're standing and go and do the, uh, uh, go and work out what it is that um, they're worried about and why they're worried about it and see actually if something that you have is going to be useful. It's it's a bit like the answer I gave to the last question really, but I think it's right. Yep. Um, okay. All right. Alex, what about you? Okay, I think there's some huge challenges here and this is something that our collective of um, social entrepreneurs are looking at in North Staffordshire because there's, there's lots of barriers um, in terms of traditional structures of power, um, limited budgets, um, conservatism it, with a small c of doing things the way they've always been done, even if they're not working right. Um, and I think it's really difficult to navigate those. And I think um, social enterprise, uh, one of Unlimited's organisational objectives is to mainstream um, social enterprise um, because it's seen as something that's over there um, and there's something over here uh, that is corporate business or traditional institutions um, and I'm really interested about how we can connect those so that they can learn from each other because I think it's a two-way learning street um, and I think in the future you know this is this is all kind of big long-term pieces of work that um, the way that the world's going at the moment, that we can't continue in the way that we are. So why can't we share good practice and um, look at alternatives and alternative ways of doing business? Yes, absolutely. Um, 
Will, do you have a question here? I do. I have a comment on that first before before we move on, if if I may. Um, I think the, the the points that that both of the other panelists have made are, are, are very valid. I think with a with a specifically kind of keel hat on, if you like, um, the university is obviously very interested in supporting charities and social enterprises and the community. It does a lot of work on that. So we've had um, charities and social enterprises through our innovation programs. We've had um, research projects that have been have been funded with them. Most recently, I think as part of COVID response, we've, we've funded over 50 interns to go into to charities and not-for-profits to work with them on, on kind of reactive um, projects that are, are really important. And we also have um, fairly recently landed a, a joint bid with the University of Birmingham uh, from the Office for Students and Research England, uh, a large part of which, you know, it's, it's a knowledge exchange bid, a large part of that will be around civic engagement, engaging with the community, engaging with social enterprises and, and supporting them to, to further their, their own projects as well. So that's just I suppose something something to let, take a look at in a specific response to to that question that came in. Um, but I'm interested to pick up a couple of things. You mentioned two fairly big uh, sounding things there, Alex. And I think one was was something around systems mapping uh, and and challenges, and one was around your place based work in in North Staffs. And I know you have an interest in kind of resilient communities. Could you give us a, a quick bit of insight into into those and, and maybe some of the stories that are emerging around that? Yeah, of course. Um, so we undertook um, a formal course on uh, systems mapping with um, a company called Acumen. Um, and that's free for groups to use. Um, we collaborated, so it was a group, um, a small group of uh, local social entrepreneurs and myself. And um, we mapped the what we thought was the current system in, in North Staffordshire. Um, and we identified that there's quite a lot of vicious circles. So there's, um, let, let me explain what that is. It's kind of a, um, as you as you would imagine, a circle that's really hard to break the cycle because there's uh, factors that are always going to affect the outcome and it's really difficult to um, have influence. Um, so we were looking at the points where we might influence. Um, so not only are there kind of institutional um, barriers that we found um, in terms of I'll give an example through commissioning um, with local authorities is a, a real challenge just the way that that process is structured for smaller organizations to be able to tender for, uh, for work um, but not only that the fact that North Staffordshire if it's selling goods and services as a, as a social enterprise, North Staffordshire hasn't got a lot of surplus cash, and I guess even even now. So businesses might be struggling. Um, they might not have um, additional uh, money to invest in supporting social enterprises as part of their corporate social responsibility um, commitments. So the, there was a lot of things, really, that we had limited control on changing that could open up some of those doorways to enable social entrepreneurs to strive because i think um we've got people with great ideas who are um starting things up they've got great experience and they've got solid propositions but actually in terms of generating income um it has been a struggle particularly those working in um sectors where they might be trying to commission services with local authorities or the NHS, for example, particularly around things like wellbeing. And I don't know, Mike, you work in that sector, so I don't know um, if you've got any comments about whether that's that rings true. Um, I, I think, yeah, that, that um, I said before, that, that sometimes even giving things away is uh, 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 hard work. Um, uh, I'm not saying that uh, the people we're working with uh, uh, have given us hard work, but it's a it's a process that you you still need to go through. Um, I, I wonder it's part of that understanding. I wonder whether some of the larger public sector organisations have a good balance of understanding of risks. A lot of those procurement uh, arrangements are are very focused on a risk uh, around giving good value for money uh, and not exposing organisations to uh, financial risk. But uh, and sometimes 
those are the risks that are concentrated on. What they what they may also do is introduce invisible risks about getting access to very high value um, suppliers who also are delivering consequential connected social benefit that that uh, it, it fits some other um, objectives that uh, organisations like uh, uh, public sector organisations, local authorities have, and so. A bit of flexibility in doing those things. Uh, in COVID and in lockdown, we've encountered quite a number of uh, public sector organisations who have been very slow to respond. So even some about whom we're, we're you know, the NHS, we're celebrating at the moment, but there are bits of the NHS that cannot still communicate effectively with their customers and their uh, patients uh, and their suppliers because the security around their video conferencing facilities like this is so tightly locked down. Uh, focusing on one risk that they introduce not a risk but a current issue of being unable to deliver some of the services they need to do. Um, so th there is a debate there but um, I, I think in terms of our influence what we really try and do is come at things from the point of view of saying what can we do for you and start that first and ask ourselves some difficult questions. It may not be possible for others, but we, we have, for example, asked ourselves the question, how could our customers get the benefit of our services without their having to pay for them? So looking other places to find the money or, or finding um, things that we can give without it costing money to build trust and relationships that start to break down some of those procurement and other things. Trust is the thing. Um, uh, if they can see some of those other benefits, then there might be some uh, willingness to look at flexibility that get over some of those problems that you've been talking about. I think that's a really good point, Mike. And, and I think commissioning is something we've certainly had that experience with in, in the past. We did some work with Bath and North East Somerset Council um, around their kind of think local, think social policy. And what we found there was, yes, there was the kind of risk element and the way that that, that was being managed and assessed. But also there was just a whole lot to be said for better communication and, and also a better understanding, not, not necessarily thinking of the two, two sides, if you like, as opposing, but to say, you know, actually, we've got small organisations that may not be familiar with complex procurement processes. We have large organisations that may not initially have set up those processes to be accessible to the types of organisations that might be able to deliver that kind of impact. And I think some of the most impactful work we did there actually was just to get both groups into a room. You tell them what you do, you tell them what you do, have a have a discussion about it. And actually that just starting to get a bit more of a shared understanding so that it's perhaps less of a, a computer says no moment at the point when you want to try and submit something, but rather a much earlier conversation so that you can you can have a look at whether that's that's a possible and whether that's something you can imagine together, um, I think can be really powerful. But it, it is it's a big challenge and I think we're we're a long way off you know, a fully functioning system in that regard, if you like. Um, so m moving uh, the conversation on a little bit, how do you feel, we talked about how this might feel for customers and how customers might interact with uh, our, you know, our organisations in a different structure. Um, how, how do you feel that this might feel for employees and do organisations like yours, yours, Mike, uh, feel differently about working for, for you as an organisation. Does that help you to to use your model to attract talent? Yes. Good. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, in case you're frightened, I'm not going to say uh, more than just yes. Um, that might be a good idea. I don't know. Um, the answer is yes, yes, yes. Um, if if people can feel engaged with the idea of doing something good in a good way. Yeah. It's a fabulous uh, way to um, attract people. People, it, it, it's almost the case if, if, if you, if, if you, the way you're attracting people by, is by the highest salary in this sector and for some of the things that we do, you're just going to be attracting the wrong people. Um, we've found some very talented people that want to come to us because they want to come to us. Um, and, um, so it's a good thing before you get here, so they have said to us, and it's a good thing when they arrive because it, it it's just a soul thing. It, it, it nurtures your soul to be doing something good with your, with your life uh, most of the time. 
Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm going to say yes. It's, it's every bit of experience we've had is is yes. Alex, what the organisations that you work with, have they found the same or similar? Absolutely. Um, the people that we work with are, are wonderful um, and not the usual suspects as well um, and, and a combination of all, all of the above. Um, so I, I know Mike said about, you know, um, people's pay and salaries and, and that and the people that are generally motivated to work in this sector um, are doing it because they're motivated by the values that underpin whatever they're doing um, and it makes for a really exciting time when you get those people together in a room um, we work with a lot of leaders with lived experience as I mentioned um, and they've got so many skills that they bring to the table it might not necessarily be business skills at the early stage but you know that's that's a work in progress we can work with people to upskill them and they can upskill each other and they can upskill me um, I'm on a learning curve as well working with um, the, the wonderful people that I do so um, yeah the answer is a definite yes um, it's it's just a wonderful um, sector to surround myself in um, people doing great things yeah absolutely so can you give us a couple of examples where where in, in the in the organizations you work with what's what's been the benefit of that the benefit to um, the organisation, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it helps drive things forward. So um, when um, individuals have been struggling to get traction with their business and there's been no income coming in or very limited, um, a lot of people might have given up, but actually it kind of gives people some motivation because they know what they're doing is... Um, needed it's it's valuable it's just because it might be slightly different so it's about being resourceful um, doing something with nothing so working with each other swapping skills rather than paying somebody to come in paying each other to do to do pieces of work within the local sector in particular you know bringing those skills together so that even if they're doing different things they might be able to um, to work collaboratively with others um, and I think those kind of softer skills um, really do help keep things going when um, times are tough which is now obviously yeah absolutely so I guess that brings in the, the question of resilience are the are, are these structures do that do they enable us to be more resilient I think that's a really interesting point because when I, when I look at um, and I work that I do outside of Kiel, you know, the, if you look at the FTSE or share index, which includes organisations along the lines of we're talking about, they tend to be 15% above traditional structures of the people in their own in their own sector. So they're doing better than those organisations in their own sector. Generally, there are exceptions, but generally that's the case. And one of the reasons that's quoted uh, for that it, um, by um, particularly other universities doing research on this, is that they are more resilient. They're resilient to change. They're much more able, more fleet of foot. They have different conversations that are going on in their organisation. Is this your experience? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so particularly with, with COVID, um, we've been doing some research about what our award winners are doing. So that's people with early stage social enterprises or other similar structures. And we've found that um, although some people have paused for now, um, many of them have been able to pivot really quickly. Um, and because they haven't got commitments in terms of large number of employees, they're able to just really understand very quickly the kind of local need um, at a really micro level um, for example we've got people doing um, meal deliveries um, that they've never done before they might have done cookery classes um, on a on quite a small scale but they've really quickly turned the business around got some support in there's loads of volunteers 
Um, and within a couple of days, they're out delivering meals and they've been doing that now for 10 weeks. So um, I think because they've got that flexibility and there's something in the mindset um, of people who work in this sector that they're, they're um, very can do and also very hands on. So they might not have the most resources, but they know how to get things done with um, very little input in terms of money or investment or anything else, really. Thanks, Stealing. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just pick up on a point that you said uh, in the sector? Because what my my experience is this isn't a sector, this is a business structure. So some of the organisations that I've worked with have been, uh, they are in the NHS, NHS who have been one of the mutuals that have spun out of, of the public sector, particularly the old PTC organisations in mental health and all this, and they've become a, a kick because it, it fits their model very nicely and it fits the social purpose of being ex NHS, if you like. So it's it's not, I would say it's not so much a sector as a, a structure that enables you to do what you want to do and how you want to run your business. Would you would you agree with that or would you think it's something different? Yeah, um, and I think it's a little bit um, intangible in many ways because I, I guess I describe it as a sector, meaning several things really. People who might have a a slightly different um, legal structure. They might be a kick or somebody with um, social values or, um, within the structure of their organisation somehow. But also people of the same mindset. So I agree, some people we've I've worked with, people from the NHS who've then gone to set up their own social enterprises because they can see that their job in the NHS was being done in a way that was... Um, not as efficient as it could be, or it was not person centred. So it's it it's a bad word to use, really, a sector, but it, it's more about that kind of mindset, that can-do attitude, and okay. um, having that purpose running at, at the the forefront of of everything that they do. Yeah. Do you have a question? I think you do, don't you? I do. I'll combine two questions in, in the interest of time, if that's OK. Um, yeah, so we've we've seen massive action from social purpose organisations in, in the form of COVID response. Um, we've also a, a, a listener commented that we've seen local communities and community organisations responding much faster and, and arguably more effectively than central government initiatives. Um, Alex, can we hear some more about COVID response locally and what that looks like? And, and also, if you've got any suggestions in a post-COVID world for how we turn that, that kind of people-powered willingness to help into delivering true social value that, that's also long-lasting for the benefit of our local community? I think locally, um, the, the social entrepreneurs that I work with have, have been almost business as usual in terms of planning um, for their future post-COVID. Um, in other areas, um, there's been a real shift. So I, I work across the, the West Midlands and uh, the North West. Um, and uh, much of that work's been immediate response, um, but in ways in which um, perhaps local government can't. I think that um, particularly like in, in Manchester, for example, where it, the... The local authority and other organisations, umbrella, umbrella organisations supporting social ventures, have, have thrown some money out, and people have just snapped it up. Um, and you know, we've got people working with those who might have been newly arrived into the country and not um, been entitled to any benefits. So they, you know, like how how do you access those people because they're not engaging with public services? Um, so the response has been um, based on that real um, local knowledge that perhaps the government doesn't know about, social services doesn't know about, the NHS might not know about. Um, in North Staffordshire, it's been um, more about future planning, I think. Um, I think a lot of the voluntary organisations have been picking up some of that kind of uh, volunteer care work um, and that sort of thing. Our social entrepreneurs have been thinking about the future and what that future looks like. Um, and to answer the second part of your question, um, it's it's interesting because I think now is a really pivotal moment where we can try and get organisations from different sectors around the table. So um, 
how can we do things differently? We we're, we're almost forced to, in a position to do this, you know, like with the um, environmental emergency, climate change. Um, local authorities are going to be struggling even more so now to provide services. And this is about um, genuine grassroots involvement in shaping services that are needed by local people. Um, and it's not being prescribed by anybody. It's um, our local social entrepreneurs want to work with people on the ground to find out what they want um, and not have services done to. Um, and for them to be appreciated for the work that they're putting in. So it might, they might be volunteers, they're being undervalued currently. So how can we really reach those people at this important time? Because they've been keeping the country going um, yeah. at a really local level. So just to, to finish off, because um, we're getting close to time right now. So I've got a question from Nick um, from uh, SIH. Uh, it's asked if collaboration is a way of handling risk averse large groups. And I, I wonder, Mike, if you can come here uh, and just talk a little bit about what what um, what are the opportunities for collaboration and how does your structure allow itself to do that in a, in a different way, perhaps? Um, I think that, that there's something about um, the, the, the dealing with the difference between the great things that have happened in a difficult circumstance because we've been compelled to do them, uh, as Alex was saying. Um, there's, there's been some really good examples of, of, of communities and organisations of all kinds doing things which people inside them or as whole organisations said could not be done before. And because of this hardship, we've overcome that. We're a great believer in this notion that don't let what you can't do get in the way of what you can do. Um, and so I think we need to remember that a number of people have you know, done things they've never done before, uh, use technology in ways they didn't do before, cut their own hair even. Um, uh, and we've got to remember that they haven't been sold that, that they were forced to do it. And if these things were possible always before, because we're just showing that all those things which were apparently impossible are now are actually possible, then we need to challenge ourselves back about the quality of our advocacy. How good were we at selling these benefits? Did we have to wait for hardship to be the catalyst for what we're doing? So if it, to answer Nick's question uh, about collaboration, it's it, we, need, we need to have a, a style of leadership together that is both supportive and challenging, that does not accept the no answer. Um, we wrote to a client recently and we actually said, we are going to bang on your door one last time to give you this. Um, and it was challenging and it was a bit irritating to them, but they did continue with us um, because we were prepared to say there's something better beyond this difficulty that we're overcoming and we're prepared to reach out and bend and change ourselves to enable you to do that. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that in it, just really reaching out uh, and challenging ourselves to say, we've got to, if it's that good, we should be better at selling it and persuading. And being in the SIH, which you are, I think that's also lent itself to you to be, because that's the spaces there, it's about, you know, its purpose is to enable organisations to collaborate. Have you found that as well, Mike? Absolutely. Um, fantastic, transformative thing for our business being part of Kiel's SIH. Fabulous um, support in terms of uh, from the university and from Santander and providing talented people who want to come and do a great thing in our business. Uh, an amazing idea. Um, I, I can't speak highly enough of it, and I'm sorry it's been the last minute uh, of this uh, 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 webinar uh, uh, before I've said that, but it's it's heartfelt. Uh, and I'd encourage anybody uh, to reach out to organisations like Kiel and Kiel specifically, um, because they have so much to offer. Um, for me personally and for our business, uh, it's just open doors that, that, that would never, I didn't even know were there, frankly.
yeah absolutely so i think it's on that note we might might need to uh close up the the webinar uh i think we'll just to to thank you so much both to alex fantastic thank you so much for giving your time today and same to you mike it's always a pleasure to talk to people who are actually trying to do this in a different way but actually we we you know, appreciate that we have such a lot of commonality around what we're all we're trying to do is to have a sustainable business model that aligns the interest of everyone within that organization for the success of the organization. And whatever your structure might be as businesses, that's what we're that's what we're trying to do. So thank you so much, Dave, to, to sharing what might be an alternative model that is actually viable. And there's so many of us that are doing that within Within uh, on the FTSE index, there are 10% of organisations using alternative models. It's not something that's that's a new thing. It's something that's been going on for centuries, actually, in reality, and very successfully. So thank you very much to you two for for sharing that. Uh, is there any last any last things you want to say there, um, Will? No, there's not. Just just to say thank you to to the panelists. There's been a couple of questions we didn't get a chance to to get to, so I've just been furiously and quietly typing responses in the chat. So apologies, but yeah, just a thank you all yeah. round and a thank you to everyone for coming along today. Okay. And just finally, thank you to the Hickson Group for hosting the platform, uh, and thank you for everyone who's given their their questions and comments today. Uh, reminder to keep that conversation going on on Twitter and LinkedIn using the hashtag hashtag Keel Talks Business. We really, really appreciate it if you do that. If you check on the website, the Keel Business website, you'll find the future webinars. There's several that are coming up over the next few months. Some really interesting topics, some really, some fantastic speakers that we've got lined up there. Um, and it, just a, a call to arms, really. It's like Mike has said, if you've got businesses there, they've got issues they want resolving, or you just want to get involved, do that through the Keel's Business Gateway. Uh, they've got a series of programs which will link you to expert, uh, you know, a level of expertise and talents from the local area, uh, and just contact the business gateway to do that. Just now to say thanks very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and um, see you next time. Thanks, folks.